Paris. In 1874, the center of the art world. And for two centuries, home to the Salon, an annual exhibition of paintings whose judges could make or break an artist's career. While strolling among the Salon paintings that spring, renowned artist Edgar Degas is said to have stopped in his tracks, stared at a particular canvas and declared, Voila! Here is someone who feels as I do. But surprisingly, that someone was a woman. And not even French. Was this foreigner who could move the French master so strongly? Mary Cassatt, A Brush with Independence, is made possible by a generous grant from the Eugene B. Casey Foundation. I have had a joy from which no one can rob me. I have touched some people with a sense of art. They felt the love and the life. Can you offer me anything to compare to that? Mary Cassatt. She felt strongly that the world around her was the object of art, not the past. She painted what she wanted to paint and, and did it in a way that few did in that time or since. She really is the first American Impressionist. Her work deals with women in a different way. She's not painting nudes. She's painting the daily lives of women, women in action. She's painting the modern life of women that she sees around her. She was extremely energetic. She was extremely opinionated. She was extremely open to new ideas. She was one of those people that was able to make things happen for her. Mary Cassatt dedicated her life to art breaking through the boundaries of her male-dominated society with images of astounding resonance. She allowed no time for a marriage and a family of her own, yet she is best remembered for her striking portraits of mothers and children. Born in 1844 near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Mary Cassatt was raised in the security of a large and well-to-do family. She made her first trip to Europe at the age of seven. Like many upper-class families, the Cassatts traveled to expose their children to art, culture, and education not available in the United States. Europe was indeed an inspiration. When the family returned to Pennsylvania four years later, Mary, like many 11-year-old girls, said she would become an artist. Unlike most, she meant it. She's looking out at the artist. She's the one whose eyes are big, um, who's obviously curious about what this artist is doing as he's portraying her and her family. In 1859, Philadelphia was the fourth largest city in the world. Now 15, Mary enrolled in the prestigious Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, one of the few schools in America that would admit women. Her colleague, Eliza Haldeman, wrote, We have several new pupils, both male and female, but Miss Cassatt and I are still at the head. We keep pretty nearly together. She generally getting the shading better, and I the form. She the ensemble, and I the minutia. As civil war ravaged the country, the young artist world revolved around their studies. 
Mary's strong drive and blossoming talent soon used up what the Pennsylvania Academy had to offer. Her longing for Europe was intense. The center of the art world was Paris, and it was a man's world. Mary made plans to travel alone to France, shocking her father. Concerned for her safety and reputation, he attempted to curb her passion, saying he'd rather see her dead than become an artist. Mary never wavered, but she did travel with her mother. They arrived in Paris for the Christmas season of 1865. She was not yet 21. She would have gone earlier except for the Civil War. She went back to Europe the minute they said it was okay for transatlantic travel. So she joined this tidal wave of young Americans who'd just been waiting for the war to be over. Cassatt, I think, needed that French air and that cheese and that coffee and that soil and those roots in France to make it work for her. It seemed to be integral to her being. She did say that in France, a woman can be who she needs to be. French culture and society, um, as restricted as all Victorian societies were, was still a more open environment for professional women than American culture was. Women were not allowed to attend the prestigious L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, so Cassatt's first order of business was to find a teacher. She was accepted by Jean-Léon Jérôme, one of the youngest and most popular of Paris masters. The other young Americans were all envious of this, her, you know, her chutzpah going up to him and her success in getting him to take her on. And it was all based on talent because you had to show your portfolio, you had to prove that you could actually do this. She was soon joined by Eliza Haldeman, Thomas Aikens, and others, sketching original old masters in the Louvre. Copying at the Louvre was the bread and butter of artistic training. This was how you learned how the masters drew. This is how you learned to put colors onto the canvas. This is how you learned about brushwork. Mary and Eliza, now great friends, became part of the throng of budding artists hoping for acceptance into the all-powerful Salon exhibition. Both were rejected in 1867, but continued to paint undaunted. Eliza wrote, Mary is getting on very well and studies hard. I think she has a great deal of talent and industry. One acquires the latter living in France. It was everyone's dream to be accepted into this salon. And amazingly enough, Mary Cassatt got one of her paintings into the salon in 1868. It was before Thomas Aikens did, it was before any of her, her male friends, American male friends in Paris. So naturally, she was thrilled. <laughs> it was great. But change was in the air. The power of the salon, the taste of its leaders, and the jury process itself were beginning to be challenged. Some artists are leaving the Academy style, and each one seeking a new way. Consequently, just now, everything is chaos. But I suppose in the end, they will be better for the change. Eliza Haldeman returned to the United States that winter, eventually to marry and give up the life of an artist. Mary remained in Paris two more years. An ambitious young woman, she balanced her distaste for the politics of the Salon against her excitement at being included among its prestigious members. She was on a collision course with the Salon system. She was a little bit too open-minded, a little bit too interested in other, other kinds of art. Um, and a little bit too um, open in expressing her opinions. In 
It took the Franco-Prussian War to drive her from Europe. Mary joined her parents at their new home in Altoona, Pennsylvania. It was headquarters for the Pennsylvania Railroad, where Brother Alec's career was taking off. But sleepy Altoona was a far cry from Paris. It was quite a mistake that I was born in America. I have not touched a brush for six weeks, nor ever will again until I see some prospect of getting back to Europe. A move to Philadelphia provided some relief. Mary accepted an allowance from her father, but insisted on paying her business expenses from her meager income as an artist. In 1900. hopes of raising money for a return to Europe, she sent two canvases to the prestigious Groupil Gallery in New York. Unsuccessful there, she took the paintings to a special exhibition in Chicago, where they were destroyed in the Great Fire of 1871. I am in such low spirits over my prospects that although I would prefer Spain, I should jump at anything in preference to America. I cannot tell you how I suffer for the want of seeing a good picture. Salvation came in the form of Father Michael Dominic, Catholic Bishop of Pittsburgh. For his new cathedral, he commissioned copies of two works by Correggio, works to be found in Parma, Italy. It was a paying job and a ticket to Europe. Mary wrote to her new friend, Emily Sartain, an accomplished engraver from Philadelphia. I am wild to be off. I have lost too much time already. The winter of 1872 found Mary Cassatt and Emily Sartain at the very center of Parma's artistic community. In addition to the Correggio copies, Cassatt tackled a new canvas that she hoped would put her back on the road to salon acceptance. All Parma is talking of Miss Cassatt, and everyone is anxious to know her. The compliments she receives are overwhelming. I shine a little by her reflection. Emily Sartain. The new painting was accepted by the Salon of 1872. Full of confidence, Cassatt again set off on her own. Unchaperoned, she traveled to Spain and was immediately struck by the power of the old masters. Velasquez, oh, my, but you knew how to paint. Titian also. Oh, dear, to think that there is no one I can shriek to. I really never in my life experienced such delight in looking at pictures. She petitioned Emily in Paris. If you don't wish to feel everlasting and eternal remorse for opportunities wasted, put yourself in a train and come down. I think one learns how to paint here. My present effort is three figures life-size halfway to the knee. All three heads are foreshortened and difficult to pose. So much so that my model asked me if the people who pose for me live long. It is the first time I have introduced a man's head into any of my pictures. Cassatt did a series of Spanish pictures. They have a sense of realism about them and a tautness, a power. They are in person very painterly and really the first of her Impressionist canvases, although that doesn't immediately come across when you see them. They were really very modern pictures in their technique. Cassatt was in Paris that April to see her work accepted by the Salon of 1873, even as canvases by Manet and Renoir were rejected. But for Mary, the Salon stamp of approval was losing its power. Emily Sartain. 
Her own style of painting and the Spanish school which she has been studying all winter is so realistic, so solid, that the French school in comparison seems washy, unflesh-like and gray. She disdains the salon pictures and all the names we used to revere. Cassatt continued her travels, studying the greatest art she could find. Her mother met her in Rome to check on her most independent of children. They spent a year traveling through Italy, Holland, and Belgium. Cassatt enjoyed a breakthrough success at the Salon of 1874. Her work drew the attention of Edgar Degas himself. But Cassatt was now acutely aware of the narrowness of the Salon judges. To be criticized by a core of stuffy old guys is something that she couldn't deal with and other painters couldn't deal with and she would not accept it then and throughout her life it didn't really matter who the stuffy old guys were she still wouldn't buy it concerned that her work wasn't selling cassatt now 30 rented a studio and apartment in paris determined to build a network of contacts and influence that would make her a commercial success sister lydia arrived to help establish a permanent and respectable home In the 19th century, siblings tended to live together if they didn't marry. This was true both of, of men and women, and she saw Lydia as her lifelong companion. Emily Sartain returned to the United States, where she would become principal of the Philadelphia School of Design for Women. Before leaving, she introduced Mary to a young woman in a Parisian boarding house. Although born into the wealth of New York's Gilded Age, Louisine Elder had an independent streak that appealed to Mary. Only 19 years old, she in turn was captivated by Mary's accomplishments and passion. Miss Cassatt was the most intelligent woman I had ever met, and I cherished every word she uttered. It seemed to me no one could see art more understandingly, feel it more deeply, or express themselves more clearly than she did. Louisine Elder In defiance of the Salon, a small group of artists had been holding independent exhibitions since 1874. Labeled independents, or worse, impressionists, they included Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Claude Monet, and Edgar Degas. They were getting written about in newspapers from London to Moscow. I mean, they were really uh, uh, they weren't the Young Turks in an establishment sense, but they were definitely, they were the Andy Warhols of their time. The first sight of Degas' pictures was the turning point in my artistic life. I used to go and flatten my nose against that window and absorb all I could of his art. It changed my life. I saw art then as I wanted to see it. Under Cassatt's influence, Louisine Elder spent her pin money on a pastel by Degas and began one of America's most impressive art collections. In 1877, for the first time in years, the Salon rejected all of Cassatt's submissions to her utter humiliation. Soon thereafter, Edgar Degas himself invited her to join in the Impressionist's next exhibition. Cassatt told Degas that she would accept with joy his invitation and wrote, at the age of 33, that she had finally begun to live. When her work appeared in the Independent Exhibition of 1879, she shut the door on the Salon forever. I think it saved her life. 
she found a group of people who were as opinionated as she was and who were as open in their aesthetic judgments as she was. And she was part of that group, and no other Americans were. Ten years Cassatt senior, Edgar Degas, too, came from money. Like Cassatt, he had broken with family tradition, leaving law school to become a painter. Like Cassatt, he found his greatest inspiration in daily events of modern life. Degas and Cassatt were part of the social class that gathered at night in Paris theaters. Emile Zola captured the glittering magic of the moment when he wrote, The great crystal chandelier was ablaze with pink and yellow. Reflections from the high gas flame sent down a rain of light from the ceiling to the floor. In one of the boxes, a bare shoulder shone like white silk. Unlike our theaters today, the lights were never extinguished. They might have gone down a bit, but part of the whole spectacle of the theater was not only what was going on on stage, but what was going on in the audience, and people went to, went to see each other. Mary began to explore the use of mirrors as a means for reflecting the interior life of women who were themselves on display. She is a good painter. At this moment, particularly engrossed in the study of the reflection and shadow of the flesh or dresses, for which she has the greatest affection and understanding. She has infinite talent. Edgar Degas. I think Cassatt found her ability to record the spectacle and the change of light and, and optical effects in the theater, through light, through mirrors, um, the, the exploration of what's real and what's not, what's real, what's illusion. Her contributions to the Independence Exhibition of 1879 were a resounding success. One critic wrote, it is impossible to visit the exhibition without being interested in the extreme in the portraits of Mademoiselle Cassatt. A sense of the most remarkable elegance and distinction mark these portraits. She is worthy of the most particular attention. The friendship between Cassatt and Degas prospered. Degas captured his protege studying paintings at the Louvre. However, both were strong-willed and often disagreed. Part of the appeal that they had for each other was this sharpness, this edge, that was um, so much a part of their relationship. Oh, I am independent. I can live alone and I love to work. Sometimes it made him furious that he could not find a chink in my armor, and there would be months when we just could not see each other. And then something I painted would bring us together again, and he would say something nice about me, or come to see me himself. It was with Degas that Cassatt embarked on a new venture that would shape her work for years to come. In the fall of 1879, they plunged into the difficult art of printmaking, planning a journal to be called Day and Night, a title that referred not only to the hours depicted, but also to the black and white prints themselves. Cassatt focused her interest on subject matter that would soon become her trademark, the casual poignancy of domestic life. Degas' interest waned, however, and Day and Night was never published. Mary's mother wrote, That which might have been a great success has not yet appeared. Degas is never ready for anything. This time he has thrown away an excellent chance for all of them. Her 
Her parents had settled permanently with Mary and Lydia by 1879. The growing depth and scope of her work reflected the joy Mary took in family life. Her brother Alec, now president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and his growing family were frequent visitors. It was Lydia, though, who was Mary's constant companion and frequent model. They were very close friends. They had many similar interests. For, for one, they loved clothes. They both um, were clothes horses, uh, wore beautiful, beautiful dresses, went, uh, patronized the best dressmakers. They also went to parties together. They read extensively, and it was a great relationship. A very private woman, Lydia left behind few letters and is seldom mentioned in those of others. But her serene strength is captured on her sister's canvases in the depiction of domestic life that became the setting for their parents' twilight days. And for Lydia's as well. Throughout her life, Lydia had suffered periods of weakness and pain. Doctors guessed at Bright's disease, a failing of the kidneys. Her father rode home to Alec in the fall of 1882. She begins to realize her danger and has lately spoken to Mary of her probable death and made her promise to have her buried in the country. Lydia Cassatt died that November. Mary was devastated. Her sister-in-law wrote, Mary is very lonesome now and says she feels that perhaps she would have been better off to have married when she thinks of being left alone in the world. She has not had the heart to touch her paintings for six months and she will scarcely now be persuaded to begin. She lost the person she thought she was going to live with. And she knew when her parents died that she would be alone. It was a, a difficult time for her. And it was one of the few things that caused her to cease painting for a while. But not for long. The family itself brought her back to her work. Her mother, Catherine Cassatt, wrote home to her grandchildren. Your Aunt Mary counts on painting out of doors and wishes she had you all there to put in her pictures. Do you remember the one she painted of you and Rob and Elsie listening to me reading fairy tales? A gentleman wants to buy it, but I don't think your Aunt Mary will sell it. She could hardly sell her mother and nieces and nephews, I think. Cassatt sold the painting within the year, creating some family friction. Eventually, the buyer returned it to her. Cassatt's modern views were apparent in her subject matter. The key here is that this woman is reading a newspaper. A woman reading a newspaper is a modern woman. She's interested in current events. She's interested in what's going on in life around her. It's about Mary Cassatt being the modern woman and being very attuned to what was going on in the life in Paris and in America at that time. Child labor and infant health care were major issues during the 1870s and 80s. Cassatt's portraits of women nurturing children reflected distinctly new ideas about child rearing. Childhood is a, a subject that undergoes great change in the 19th century. The idea of childhood as a special and separate time of life um, is extremely important. It's a much more modern view of children, that they are not tiny adults. It's a different time of life. Almost all my pictures with children have the mother holding them. Would you could hear them talk? 
their philosophy would astonish you. I think she was a feminist in the feminism of her day and her culture. Cassatt, in the 80s and 90s, in her maternal subjects, is trying to show the important natural bond between a mother and child, the biological bond between a mother and child, and that women, if they are not the economic and financial head of the household, certainly should be the moral head of the household. People started saying the obvious, which was, how come a woman who has no children, is not married, is specializing in, in mothers and children? And does it have something to do with her own feelings of inadequacy and all of the kinds of things that you just don't want people to say about you? And it's a real sign of her courage that she continued on with the theme, that she developed it to the extent that she did in the face of this challenge to her own femininity. Cassatt's work was now on regular exhibit both in Paris and New York with Paul de Ruel, the dealer who had put the Impressionists on the map. Mary is at work, intent on fame and money. After all, a woman who is not married is lucky if she has a decided love for work of any kind. And the more absorbing it is, the better. Catherine Cassatt. In 1890, Paris was transformed by L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts exhibition of Japanese prints, a watershed moment in the history of French art. An exhibition which inspired Cassatt and her Impressionist colleagues to new heights. You must see the Japanese. Come as soon as you can. You couldn't dream of anything more beautiful. I dream of it and don't think of anything else but color on copper. The Japanese prints captured aristocratic courtesans performing daily tasks similar to those that had already inspired Degas and Cassatt to their finest work. She begins working in the Japanese style to make her own suite of color prints. And she uses contemporary Parisian subjects but does them a la Japanese. A primary color, strong outline, a flattening of the picture plane, almost a, a shorthand and less illusionistic rendering of her subject matter. It was an old process, but one that she recreated for her needs. She wanted to, in some way, incorporate that look into her art, but not by carving wood blocks, but rather to do them on copper plates. She made the process of color aquatint her own the way no one else did. There were, there were few artists that dared to take up this daunting and challenging medium. And she did it in a way that characterizes her tenacity and her energy. The color prints document the actual creative process. Because it's been printed so many times in so many different stages, you get a record of what the artist was thinking. And in the case of the omnibus, you have the drawing, which was her first idea about what the print should be like. And it includes a male figure. The fact that that male figure is removed once she starts actually putting lines onto the plate, to me, has two different explanations. One is compositional, that it, it was a very busy composition with that extra figure in it. The second explanation is that she tended not to be happy with the male figures that she painted or drew. They didn't have the kind of emotional connection to the other figures in the composition that the female figures did. Unlike other printmakers, Cassatt did it all herself. 
Cassatt was there either printing it herself on her own press in her studio or standing next to the printer as it was being printed, totally engaged in this process. She was very much in the vanguard in printmaking, far ahead of Degas and all of her Impressionist colleagues. In the winter of 1891, the Cassatt family suffered another tragedy. Robert Cassatt had once told his daughter he'd rather see her dead than an artist. Since then, he had become her staunchest supporter. His death was a heavy blow. He seemed to sleep naturally, but there were slight convulsions before the end. Both the nurses and the doctor assured us that he did not suffer in the least. I'm very much depressed in every way and long for a change. Luckily, an old friend returned. Louisine and her husband H.O. Havemeyer took Mary around Europe to help build their world-class art collection. As the French say, Miss Cassatt had the flair of an old hunter and her experience had made her as wise as Solomon in art matters. Mr. Havemeyer had the true energy of a collector, while I, well, I had the time of my life. Louisine Havemeyer. All the pictures privately bought by rich Americans will eventually find their way into public collections and enrich the nation and the national taste. Cassatt had a great sense of patriotism and she wanted to see America lift itself out of this rather primitive place in terms of their culture. She really wanted to see great art in this country. Cassatt's own collection included numerous works by Degas as well as by Courbet, Pizarro and Monet. Her artistic eye, however, remained as independent as ever. Monet's water lily pictures look to me like glorified wallpaper. I won't go so far as Degas, who thinks he has done nothing worth doing for 20 years. But it is certain that these decorations without composition are not to my taste. In the spring of 1892, Cassatt was asked to create a mural depicting modern woman for the Chicago World's Fair, the largest fair in history. In a way, she did it kicking and screaming because she was not given enough time to do it the way she wanted to do it. But it was for the woman's building, which was a very important feminist statement, so how could she say no? The decorative tradition of mural painting went against all that Cassatt believed in, but a discussion of the subject with Degas led her to a quick change of mind. The bare idea of such a thing put Degas in a rage, and he did not spare every criticism he could think of. I got my spirit up and said I would not give up the idea for anything. She thought it was a very worthy theme. The modern woman, perfect for her. She'd been grappling with this issue all of her life. It showed young girls pursuing science and knowledge. It showed older women passing down the fruits of knowledge from a tree to young girls. The figures were very three-dimensional, and the dress, the fashion, was extremely important. And these things were lost in the distance that people had to see it in. And it got terrible reviews once it got up on the wall. Nevertheless, Cassatt was hitting her stride as an artist of innovative vision. In 1894, at the age of 50, she painted one of her most startling works. Cassatt's boating party is a homage to that of Manet. She clearly admired Manet, as all the Impressionists did. He was not an Impressionist, but he was sort of their path breaker. 
But the difference between Manet's boating party, where the male is a central figure who's clearly in charge, and the woman is very relaxed, when you get to Cassatt's boating party, she's reversed this. The man has his back to us. He's sort of the laborer. He's doing, he's doing the heavy rowing. But um, the triangular composition puts the, the woman and the child uh, clearly at the center, and they are the focus. In 1894, Mary acquired a country estate called Beaufren, just north of Paris. It provided an escape from city life, a haven for her family, and served as proof of her established success as an artist. Eight o'clock in the morning would find her in her gray blouse in a small pavilion over the dam which fed her pièce d'eau. There she would work while daylight lasted. She had a relatively large estate, hundreds of acres, and she was able to convert as much of it as was humanly possible into gardens. I have over a thousand flowers planted and already fancy myself sniffing the perfume and reveling in the color. Oh, there is nothing like making pictures with real things. Catherine Cassatt passed away in October of 1895. She was more than just Mary's mother. She was a powerful inspiration. And to many other illustrious names in the art world, she was a friend. Anyone who had the privilege of knowing Mary Cassatt's mother would know at once that it could be from her and her alone that she inherited her ability. Mrs. Cassatt had the most alert mind I had ever met. She was a fine linguist, an admirable housekeeper, remarkably well-read, was interested in everything. To poor Miss Cassatt, the loss is irreparable. She struggles bravely. Louisine Havemeyer. In her grief, Cassatt once again turned to family and to work. She painted niece and namesake Ellen Mary. The work was therapeutic, allowing her to spend long hours with the people she loved. In 1898, Cassatt returned to the United States, her first visit in 25 years. I lost my mother two years ago. I was so bereft and so tired of life that I thought I could not live. Now I know I must, and I am here to see quite a new world and renew old friends and to work. From Philadelphia to New York and New England, she made important personal contacts with the American art establishment. The most important aspect of her life in the 1890s and after the turn of the century was that she truly became internationally famous. And as we know, this is not an easy thing to achieve. She worked very hard to get to this position. It meant understanding how to market your work, attracting the attention of a major dealer, getting to know critics, people to write about you, all the things that go into creating a reputation. What finally put it over the top was that she began exhibiting very steadily in the United States. As she entered the 20th century, Mary Cassatt proved more independent than ever. She joined the growing spiritualist movement and attended seances in the hope of contacting her departed mother. Beaufren had become a place of pilgrimage and Cassatt a champion of young artists. She spoke often about the evils of juried exhibitions. 
I think the jury system may lead to a high average, but in art, what we want is the certainty that the one spark of original genius shall not be extinguished. To serve on the jury is entirely against my principles. I would never be able to forgive myself if through my means any pictures were refused. I know too well what that means to a young painter. It was so common for the American, young American art students to come and visit her that they would take the train out to the, the local train station and would get off the train and of course we're looking around, what am I going to do next? And the people at the train station were so used to this that they would just point the way to Cassatt's Chateau. An American student wrote, there at the far end, where the shades were drawn, sitting almost as one on a throne, I saw her, my idol, Mary Cassatt. She did not smile, only sat there, arrogantly proud, austere. So you're an American, she said. I don't like Americans. I've been in France too long. But sit down. You've come a long way to see me, and we'll talk. Now in her 60s, Cassatt had difficulty accepting the latest artistic innovations. She had little patience for Henri Matisse or other artists displayed at Leo and Gertrude Stein's notorious salons. I have never in my life seen so many dreadful paintings in one place. Cassatt was not um, accepting of the modern movement. She, she felt that she was the modern movement. And of course, this is the problem with living too long. You think you're the, the modern movement and you've been sort of passed by. It would have taken really an extraordinary vision to leap beyond the place that she was in. Everything Cassatt fought for as an artist was about realism, really. It was about a realistic portrayal of life around her. In 1911, Mary Cassatt took a vacation, a rare occurrence. She joined younger brother Gardner and his family and set out for Egypt. At first, she was unimpressed. The climate and even the country is a great disappointment. And apart from some of the temples, there is nothing to see. But a month later, she had changed her mind. I fought against it, but it conquered. How are my feeble hands to ever paint the effect on me? Fancy going back to babies and women. I am crushed by the strength of this art. Their trip was cut short when Gardner became dangerously ill. We are much worried over the breakdown of my brother. The climate has not agreed with him. He has fever. We hope only Nile fever. Gardner Cassatt died shortly after returning to Paris, and Mary was nearly destroyed by the physical and psychological drain. She couldn't paint for two years. Struggling with the onset of diabetes, she revised her will and gathered the remains of deceased family members, placing them in the local cemetery under a granite tombstone engraved with their names and her own. But Mary survived, and her reputation was growing. A solo exhibition in Paris in 1914 brought bids from the Luxembourg and Petit Palais and from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. In addition, Louisine organized a joint exhibit of works by Cassatt and Degas benefiting the Women's Political Union. Mary was especially thrilled that the misogynist Degas would unwittingly be raising funds for women suffragists.
The life that Europe had known collapsed with the outbreak of World War I. As the Germans marched toward Paris, Cassatt held fast, but was eventually forced to flee Beaufren to the sound of cannon fire. Despite failing health and cataracts in both eyes making it difficult to paint, Cassatt contributed to the war effort. She even invented and patented a hammock that eased the strain on fractured bones. In World War I, in her letters to Louisine Havemeyer, she says, well, you know, here we are, all these governments headed by men. We have a world war, everybody's dying left and right. Generations of French and English boys are being slaughtered. The men have not done a good job. Let's let the women have a hand at it. As to the suffrage for women, it must come as a result of this awful war. With the slaughter of millions of men, women are now being forced to do their work, and we have only begun. As the fighting receded, Mary anxiously returned home. I leave for Paris by motor on Saturday. I intend to go to Beaufren later. The cannon is no longer heard there. Cassatt checked on Degas, whose health was failing rapidly. At her urging, his niece had come to live with and care for him. What satisfaction it was to me to know that he had been well cared for. One sometimes can help a little in this world, not often. But in the fall of 1917, she wrote to Louisine. You have seen that Degas is no more. We buried him on Saturday, a beautiful sunshine, a little crowd of friends and admirers all very quiet and peaceful in the midst of this dreadful upheaval of which he was barely conscious. His death is a deliverance, but I am sad. He was my oldest friend here, and the last great artist of the 19th century. I see no one to replace him. She really was unable to paint and unable to conduct her life within the art world. This is when she begins to get really depressed. In looking back over my life, how elated I would have been if in my youth I had been told I would have the place in the world of art I have acquired. And now at the end of life, how little it seems. What difference does it all make? Mary Cassatt was in Paris in the winter of 1926 when she slipped into a diabetic coma. But as she had done so many times before, she persevered. She returned to her beloved Beaufren that spring and surrounded by her flowers, died peacefully on June 14th. My dearest Louis, one does get tired of the world. I have not done what I wanted to, but I tried to make a good fight of it. What makes her work continue to speak is the strength of her female figures. They're not particularly beautiful, but they are powerful. They are women treated with respect. There really is such a passion for these subjects, and there's such a profound relationship between the sitters, the mothers and the children, uh, a baby's touch, a mother's caress, uh, that was clearly felt by this woman and characterizes the compulsion she felt about doing something unique. She made sure that Americans collected important contemporary art as well as old master pictures. Cassatt really felt herself to be an American, um, comfortable in French culture, but really wanted American museums to have the best of European art and made a conscious effort to, to have that happen. Metaphorically speaking, we all have to go into that studio and confront the blank canvas and say, okay, what are we going to do? 
and you know, and that's what we all do when we get up in the morning. You know, we confront the blank canvas. And she literally did it, and I think she can be an inspiration to us. I have had a joy from which no one can rob me. I have touched some people with a sense of art. They felt the love and the life. Can you offer me anything to compare to that? Mary Cassatt. Mary Cassatt, A Brush with Independence, was made possible by a generous grant from the Eugene B. Casey Foundation.